in terms of um, which American uh, leader do I think was most like him? Uh, in terms of being a force for good in the world, in terms of defeating tyranny, and in terms of, li of freeing the enterprise of a, uh, of a free people, Reagan. Uh, if there is anyone who's, uh, whose face belongs on, on Rushmore, I'd have thought it's got to be the Gipper. <laughs> yes, please. Okay, um, on, the, on the first point, it, on paper, uh, the United States is a more secular country than most European countries. Uh, we still have an established church in the United Kingdom. The Queen is the supreme governor of it. And that is the case in most of the countries on the continent. But Europe is a continent of empty cathedrals. That although the structure of an old state church is still there, the congregations have dwindled. Now, I think there is a connection between those two facts. What you have here with a, a system where there is no established religion and where there is, if you like, competition between different denominations is a kind of privatization. <laughs> it's a kind of free market, right? Uh, it, it, uh, and it has all the benefits of people shopping around. And when they have then made their choice, they feel attached to the choice they've made in terms of church attendance in a way that they wouldn't do if they had simply automatically been allocated the, the church into which they'd been baptized and because it was the one that everyone else had, which is what the, 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 this, most of Europe is, is in that condition. So it's funny because uh, I, the, Spain recently moved to disestablish its, its church. The, the, the Catholic Church uh, in Spain until very recently had a privileged position under the law. And the result of that is that, like any nationalized industry, it had become flabby. It had become lazy because it, there was no reason for it to go out there and compete for souls. <laughs> and, and so the socialist government in Spain, although actuated by a rather old-style 1930s anti-clericalism, is probably doing the, the Spanish church a tremendous favor because cut free of the dead hand of state control, I suspect that the, the Catholic church in Spain will go out and start trying to fill its views again. Uh, and I, I suspect a similar thing is true in Britain. British conservatives are deeply uh, attached to anti-disestablishmentarianism. It's not often that you get to use that word, is it? When, <laughs> when it's genuinely apt and apposite. So there we are. But um, uh, but they but you know if they would only be logical, they would see that the same argument that they use to liberalise British telecom, British airways, and so on would equally apply to the Church of England. And I think if we had a system uh, uh, like yours, where there is mutual respect but freedom among competing denominations. Uh, there would be something of a, uh, a, a, of a rise in attendance. Um, sorry, your, your second question was... Um, How do you view the British yeah. media? Uh, the British media is like yours. It, it, its default setting is to the left, I mean, badly to the left. We had a, a classic example of this last week. Um, we had a by-election uh, in Norwich, which my, my party won, which it was always going to do. But the BBC decided in an early stage in the campaign that the Green Party was going to win. Now, I don't know whether they actually thought that this was going to happen or whether they hoped to make it happen because, of course, when you're a very small party, uh, you benefit. The, 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 the thing you most crave is equal treatment in the mainstream media. Uh, the funny thing was that the party that had, the Greens were fifth at the last election there. They weren't just behind Conservative, Liberal, and Labour, the three big ones. They were behind the UK Independence Party. <laughs> and the UK Independence Party went to the BBC and said, well, hang on, you know. It, if you're going to treat this as a four-party race, what about us? And, of course, well, there's no way the BBC is going to do that because these people are anti-Brussels, they're anti-immigration, they're climate change sceptics. They're not nice people. So the, the, the Greens, you know, <laughs> they deserve a fair crack of the whip. And so on the eve of poll, we had Green candidates and Green spokesmen still being uh, talked up on the state broadcaster as though they were going to be the, the, the winners. Well, of course, they came fifth again, well behind the UK Independence Party again, or worryingly uh, far behind the UK Independence Party, as a BBC presenter put it, with wonderful <laughs> unconscious bias. Um, so, you know, we really, we really do have a... a, a, a that's one of... A, a, there was a, a, a... About a month before that, one of the 
drama editors, who are not, well, not even on politics, said, it's the role of the BBC to foster left of, se of centre thinking. Well, if you listen to any of the BBC dramas, you'll see that it's already doing that. You know, they're always predicated on the idea that capitalism is wicked and, and all the rest of it. But here's the good news. It doesn't really matter much anymore. These old media monoliths are losing their audience share almost by the minute. And the great advantage that we have as conservatives is that we are disintermediating the message. Until very recently, whenever there was a big news event, we relied on a broadcast journalist to stand in front of the camera with a microphone and interpret it for us and praise it for us and tell us what we ought to think about it. And now we don't do that anymore. Now we can go online and we can see the thing for ourselves. We can watch the whole speech at first hand and make up our own minds about it. You can go to the websites of competing candidates and see for yourself where they will actually change your life instead of having a left-wing journalist telling you what he thinks you ought to know. And that has got to be good news, not just for the right in particular, but good news for the cause of freedom and truth in general because you will have a more informed citizenry, which means that you will have a freer populace. And so I'm really optimistic about the long-term political consequences of the internet. Just as a party leader can no longer deliver his voters, so an editor can no longer deliver his readers, and that has got to be good news for those of us who believe in freedom. Um, I think we've got time for a... I'll tell you what I'll do. Tell you what I'll do. I will take a round of questions, uh, and then I'll come back so that nobody's left out. Mrs. Murray. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman at the back there, yes. Yes, please. My maternal grandfather was born and raised in Birmingham, England. Mm -hmm. Eventually came to the United States, went to medical school, became a doctor in Ohio, and settled in Colorado. My mother and her sister uh, went to nurses' training, so I have always had some special interest in, in medical uh, affairs. It is not by any means certain that we are going to have what Obama and the Democrat leadership in the Congress once had. Uh, there's still a chance that we can defeat it. But assuming that they get what they want, which leads to a single payer uh, system, um, and we are all going to be under that system, what alternatives do you suggest that we might have open to us as Americans, if we are denied medical treatment that we think that we ought to have in the United States. Thank you. And uh, was, was somebody over here? Yes, please. Uh, uh, when will the next election be in, in Britain? And uh, am I correct that presuming there'll be a massive change in the government at that time? Okay. And the lady there, yes, please. Okay, I'll, is there anybody else? Okay, thank you. Um, I'll take those in, in reverse order. Um, there are far fewer lawsuits um, because there's, uh, you, you don't have, the, if you like, a contractual relationship in the way that you would have with an insurer. Um, you can, if you are a, in, a, in a private system, you can say, I have paid for this to happen. If it didn't happen, I should be compensated. Obviously, that aspect of it doesn't doesn't exist where you have a state system. That's not to say that you can't claim compensation if somebody sort of chops the wrong leg off or something, right? I mean, if, if there is a case of, uh, of, of just a, a complete error of that kind, then, then you're still covered by the normal laws on tort and, and uh, redress and so on. But the, the, the idea that you can claim uh, redress simply because the thing that you were hoping would happen hasn't happened, uh, that, that doesn't exist under, under our system. By the way, I think... I, I, I think your system could be improved if there was less litigation. I mean, I, I, I'm just saying that as a as an observer. And I, I um, you know, when um, when I read statistics saying you know most Americans favor reform of healthcare, well, yeah. I mean, the only extraordinary thing about that is that 20 whatever percent don't favor reform of healthcare. I mean, it is, it is always possible to improve a system. Um, and I think you could do things that would shift towards kind of individual healthcare accounts that would um, have more of a market mechanism because. You know, an insurance system isn't perfect either. 